obs. You know, you go, well, you know, Nietzsche's right. By God, I've just been in insurance too long. I, it's, like, it's like that Monty Python skit, the guy who wants to become a lion tamer. He's in accounting. Of course, Monty Python, they consider accounting to be uh, an illness, right? I mean, they have, you, you go to therapists and doctors to be cured of being an accountant. And so in, in, in one skit, this guy says, well, I think I'll be a lion tamer. Problem is, he doesn't know what a lion is, and so John Cleese shows him a picture of a lion. He says, oh, God, no, no. And he says, well, maybe you should take it step at a time and go into banking next. And he went, yeah. <laughs> well, now, this Nietzsche's challenge is more than to change jobs from accounting to banking to even being sort of the captain of a little skiff for a year on your, you know, say, on your savings or whatever. It's to live a life that is in some sense, and I don't, here I don't want to even, I hate to use the word art because it trivializes it, but in a way to live a life that's like a work of art, like Hamlet in the sense that you'd be willing to play that part again. Yeah, I did well enough, I want to play it again. And that includes all the things that Nietzsche knows about the pain of life, which I, I hope I've tried to make clear through some of the examples I've used including those moments, would you be willing to play the part again and again? So the way I've always seen the eternal recurrence is not as an ethical theory so much as a challenge to fashion a life for you that's worth living. Now, to understand this, you need to see that Nietzsche uh, is using a myth here of the eternal recurrence precisely because he's done what I have earlier argued that he does, He's rejected the dogmatic tradition of philosophy where you attempt to answer the question I attempted to answer in my first series of lectures and failed, namely, what is the best kind of life for human beings? Nietzsche thinks there is no general answer to that question, but he thinks it's a supremely important question. But he doesn't, by general answer, that means there's not one answer that I can find and then I give you the argument and all of you go, oh yeah, that's right, that's the best one, we'll all do it. No, this myth takes, uh, this, this challenge takes place on a different, in a different narrative and with a different kind of challenge. And in a way, it, it puts the, the, the burden upon the reader, the interpreter, as it were, to ask the question, well, could I love fate that much? That for wherever it's put me and whatever it's put before me, I'd be willing to play this drama of self-creation that I've already either attempted or escaped from over and over again. Now, I think that, that uh, it is a powerful challenge. I think if we, the more we think about it, the, the sort of more horrifying it becomes. You know, I mean, in a way, uh, this is why uh, modernists, uh, and, and, and this modernists now I'm referring to, uh, both texts written by the so-called modern writers and modernist cinema uh, people, such as Woody Allen, uh, uh, are so sort of freaked out by death. I mean, it's both uh, a perplexing and frightening thing to die, but it's also a kind of nice thing because uh, n now the hypochondria is finally over and it's been proven that you were right. I mean, Woody both is afraid of death, but then in a way it will justify him because He's been a, a hypochondriac, you know, all his life, and his, he takes aspirin, and he d talks about death, and he reads books about death, and he sees all these Ingmar Bergman movies about death, and death, death, death. But part of that is the very fascination with it, because when it finally comes, then you can, you won't be around to see it. Oh, by God, you thought I was a hypochondriac, but look, I died, and I said I would. Well, hardly surprising, but at least you're justified, stand justified before that belief. So there is a... Uh, 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 a fascination with that. And in bourgeois culture in general, uh, Sartre once said that if you were going to tell a dying person one thing that would make them happy, and, and I think this is why we built it, not why, there were many reasons why we did, and a lot of them had to do with valorizing capital. But uh, one reason why nuclear weapons and the specter of an apocalypse was so attractive, utopian, and fascinating, and I mean all that seriously. This is a joke because Look, Hollywood made thousands of movies about apocalypses and people. Oh, the missiles of October, I want to see that documentary again. And that always blew the world up. And the giddiness of apocalypse and, and all these movies uh, is, is sort of based on a, a, a point by Sartre. If you could tell a dying person one thing that would make them happy, it's that 
everybody else is dying too right now as you die. When you die, you're all going to die together. You're going to have at least that one communal experience under capitalism of all going out at once. And you go, well, geez, I've got to die, but old Bob down at the office, <laughs> I mean, he's, he's not ready. He's going to, you know. So, uh, so Nietzsche, though, this, Nietzsche's challenges is in a way scarier because death won't even stop this, this process of self-creation for Nietzsche. See, because you'll just, if you do something really badly and die and people forget about it, that won't happen because you'll have to do it again and again and again and again and again. Now, again, Nietzsche doesn't hold this as a, as a, as a view about the cosmology of the world or that things actually will occur again and again. But if one, view, you might ask yourself this question, if I viewed my life as, as a part, as a persona, and I was trying to create myself in a more conscious way than I am, because in a certain sense we're all trying to create and recreate ourselves all the time. I think that's why a lot of people now, uh, lots of people now, stay in graduate school until well past their midlife so that you can continually be creating yourself and, you know, oh, well, I'm taking anthropology this, this month and this month I'm into strong. Well, this is to give you a patina, a pathetic patina of self-creation beneath contempt. But anyway, another story. Ooh, boy, I came in. I'm really in a good mood. I don't know why this is sounding so nasty here. It's supposed to be challenging and life-affirming and fun. Uh, in any case, uh, I, I don't think that there's, uh, th 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 I think that the question Nietzsche wants you to ask is this. Uh, engaged in my own self-creation, could I do this? And then my point was going to be that we are, in fact, engaged in acts of self-creation with varying degrees of consciousness that that's what we're doing. Nietzsche had the misfortune of being supremely, acutely, perhaps pathologically aware, and I mean, I'm certainly pathologically aware in my opinion. I think, I think all the great theorists and philosophers and literary people, uh, practically all of them, were delusional in one or another important sense of that word. It's okay. God, what a boring uh, you know, species would be without people who are delusional nuts, if you will. Really boring. But uh, uh, Nietzsche was acutely aware of his own self-creation. And of course, that's what comes out in these uh, high, very hyperbolic style and the aphorisms. And when Nietzsche calls himself, you know, in, in one book, he, he, he gives it the title, Behold the Man. And it ha the book has titles like, I mean, has a chapter titles like, Why Am I So Clever? Why Do I Never Make Mistakes? You know, he responds to himself by saying, I have never bothered with questions that are none. I mean, it's beyond question that I never make mistakes. I'm very clever. So, I mean, Nietzsche is acutely, almost insanely aware of his own self-creation. A process, as I say, that we all undergo, but under conditions where we're not nearly so aware as Nietzsche was. Uh, Ernst Jones, the biographer of Freud, and I'm not sure this is a compliment about Nietzsche, Ernst Jones, Freud's biographer, once said of Nietzsche, says, well, Jones didn't. Jones said that Freud said, so we don't know if it's true or not, but Jones said that Freud said about Nietzsche that he knew more about himself than any man who ever lived or was ever likely to live. That's someone addicted to self-reflection about their own self-creation. So it was Freud's judgment that he knew more about himself than than anyone who ever lived or was ever likely to live. Uh, so what sets the eternal challenge, I mean, the eternal return as a challenge is not just to do the same things you've done, but to be consciously aware of the way a creator is of their creation about yourself, see, with no God to be the creator of you as fallible, finite, and you, know, you can always, I mean, what, what an excuse. You know, I mean, you actually hear it in the death house sometimes is the last, you know, remark trying to sway the judge. You'll go, well, you know, don't execute me. I mean, God made me this way. What the heck? It's a nice excuse because 
uh, if you're familiar enough with the Odysseys, there's some truth to it, of course. If God knew everything, he knew about Charlie Manson long before Charlie Manson did. He went ahead and let Charlie do some awful things. If you don't know about that, about that serial killer, I, I know about a lot of them. I say seri well, I, I can't get into certain serial killers in uh, giving uh, lectures in Washington, D.C., because to name some of them is libelous. No, anyway, that's, 